many successful pathogens have evolved mechanisms to evade T cell uh, immune response. So let's go over a few of those pathogens and how a pathogen can hide from the immune system by interfering with the T cell response. So we'll start with herpes viruses. Uh, herpes viruses are excellent at infecting people and staying around for their entire lives. So the immune system uh, has a really hard time uh, removing all herpes viruses from the body. And that is to do to um, the cell types that herpes viruses infect. So herpes viruses can infect epithelial cells. They can also infect neurons. And some of the ones that we think about in terms of viruses, like the ones that cause cold, cause cold sores or genital warts, um, these can infect neurons, such as sensory neurons. And those neurons are privileged sites in terms of the immune system being able to access them and remove pathogens from them. So here's an epithelial cell. It is presenting um, peptides and MHC class 1 molecules to CD8 T cells. And that immune uh, response can be recognized and those cells can be removed by CD8 positive T cells. With sensory neurons, this is where herpes viruses um, go to become dormant, or we use the term latent, or latency. So the viruses can infect these neurons, produce very low levels of proteins, and when they produce these low levels of proteins, uh, these peptides um, are less likely to be presented on MH class 1. The other thing about neurons is they have expressed an extremely low level of MHC class 1 protein. So there is very poor antigen presentation on neurons. So when neurons are infected, it is um, difficult for the immune system to access the neurons and recognize the peptides presented on those neurons because those um, cells have a very, very low level of, HI, of uh, MHC class 1 expression. And so when you think of a uh, herpes simplex virus that uh, leads to cold sores, or when you think of other herpes viruses in the families of uh, herpes, for example, the chicken's pox virus, which is varicella zoster virus, that's a herpes virus. Both of these types of viruses, when they infect individuals, they might cause a, um, symptoms, physical symptoms, but then those viruses go dormant or latent, hiding out in sensory neurons, and then they can be reactivated sometimes later due to stress or other factors that are not necessarily known. And for example, chickenpox, when individuals are infected with chickenpox, they have a uh, response, a physical response to these poxes on their bodies. But uh, after the immune system clears the infection that's causing those symptoms, the virus retreats to neurons in the body and individuals who are infected by varicella zoster uh, maintain that infection their entire life. So these viruses are rarely cleared from the neurons. And some stressful event uh, tends to activate these viruses in some individuals, and those individuals suffer from very painful uh, reactivation of the virus, and that is called shingles. So shingles is just the chickenpox virus reactivating, uh, restarting the viral life cycle, and uh, causing uh, damage to neurons, and that's what causes the painfulness of shingles. Uh, there's another herpes virus, which we'll talk about now, and we'll talk about another one in the next uh, slide, Epstein-Barr virus. So Epstein-Barr virus is another herpes virus. Uh, this virus infects B cells. Um, can B cells be infected? Of course they can. They can be infected by a virus. Uh, this virus, Epstein-Barr virus, it causes um, the disease mononucleosis, or mono, in some individuals. Epstein-Barr virus can infect, uh, actually has infected most humans, and only in a small subset does it lead to those uh, mono-type symptoms of extreme fatigue um, and proliferation of B cells. So in those individuals, and in most people who are infected with Epstein-Barr virus, the virus stays with you forever because the virus goes latent in your B cells. So the virus um, is able to hide from the immune system because when the virus is infecting B cells, it can um, go into a, a viral life cycle phase where it produces one protein called EBNA1. So the virus's genome is there, and this one viral protein is there, and that's what's maintaining the virus's DNA. And the thing about this protein 
is it cannot be presented uh, on MHC class one molecules. Uh, so the immune system does a terrible job of antigen processing and presentation of EBNA1. So that means the CD8 positive T cells will never recognize this is a virally infected cell, and these cells will just keep dividing, and they will keep copying the virus's DNA, and the EBNA1 protein will be maintaining that virus's DNA, and the virus stays with you forever, and it can be reactivated and then go back to be la being latent. So these are three different F uh, herpes viruses, uh, herpes simplex virus, uh, varicella zoster virus and Epstein-Barr virus. They are all part of the herpes virus family and they can all uh, evade the immune response quite nicely and, re and remain latent in an individual their entire life. The last herpes virus we'll talk about and has been very well studied uh, in terms of its immune evasion properties is called CMV or cytomegalovirus. Again, it's another virus that most people, uh, at least in the U.S., probably on Earth, are infected with. And when you're infected with it, it causes flu-like symptoms, fever, aches, sore throat. Uh, and once you're infected, uh, it typically doesn't kill people unless they're immunocompromised or uh, very, very young or very, very old. But uh, if you have a pretty good immune system, you can repel the infection in terms of uh, keeping it from damaging your organs and tissues, but you can never clear the infection. So there's another virus which infects individuals and goes latent because it can evade the immune response. So uh, there are at least 10 genes responsible for making proteins that interfere with T cell in, um, rec uh, recognition. And I just want to cover some mechanisms because it's really interesting, I think. Um, so we know when cells are infected with virus, viral protein is made, and hopefully that protein is processed by the proteasome and broken down into peptides. Those peptides are sent into the ER through the tap, and the MHC1 is loading those peptides and presenting this to CD8 T cells. And that's how we get um, the immune system to recognize an infection. Well, with cells infected with CMV, CMV produces proteins that inhibits this uh, process at a number of different steps. So, for example, it makes a protein that inhibits the TAP transporter. If you inhibit, if you block up the TAP transporter, then you're not moving peptides into the ER. Peptides won't get loaded, and you won't present those peptides to T cells. So, uh, proteins. Uh, so, immune evasion that inhibits TAP would inhibit uh, antigen peptide loading in the ER. Uh, CMV also makes a protein that inhibits the proteasome so that the proteasome does not process the viral proteins into peptides that can get transported into the tap. So even if the tap was there, uh, we wouldn't have peptides that could be sent into the ER um, that could be used to recognize the infection. Um, the other thing that the virus does is it makes a protein that pulls the uh, MHC molecule out of the ER. So when you make membrane proteins, you do this in the rough ER, so you've got ribosomes attached to the endoplasmic reticulum, and you put your membrane proteins in the ER membrane. Well, the virus makes a protein that threads it out, and now this uh, MHC molecule is no longer in the ER. Now it's in the cytoplasm, and that's not where it belongs, and it ends up getting uh, destroyed. Uh, so, and you can't load peptides on it there either. Um, it also, that's sending the MHC1 from the ER into the cytoplasm. Um, there are more mechanisms, and those are just a couple I wanted to cover. Um, you can take an entire course on viral immune evasion, um, and you would learn a lot about how the immune uh, system uh, combats infection and how infections fight back. So successful viruses have found mechanisms to evade the immune system, and this video covers a few of those mechanisms in terms of interfering with T-cell response.